the guns of autumn are stilled. In large concentrations, on the marshes, lakes, and rivers of the middle United States, mallards have been resting and feeding. It makes no difference that much of their chosen territory is ice-covered. These hardy individuals do not mind low temperatures so long as they have their basic wants satisfied. Some open space to protect them from harassment by enemies, some open water to drink and bathe in, and a source of nourishing food. These flocks may be composed of late migrants southward, but they may also be early migrants to the north. Whatever they may be, they all have one aim, to rest and feed, readying themselves for the long trip to the northern prairies, their ancestral nesting grounds. A lot of our knowledge about these birds has come from information gleaned from numbered aluminum bands, like this hen wears. In late winter, about 65% of the birds are males, now easily recognized. Recognized by that famous curl in their tail feathers, russet breasts, grayish-white bellies, white collars, and blackish heads with iridescent green sheen. By comparison, the female is drab, wearing a demure plumage of soft browns, buffs, and blacks. Drakes weigh about three pounds, hens slightly less. Mallards manifest behavior associated with courtship all winter long. Here a hen displays, apparently in an attempt to ward off competing males. In late afternoon, the birds become hungry and restless. They swarm out in ragged flocks, winging across the sky to nearby fields. There they drop into the stark remains of last year's crop to forage on grain scattered during man's harvest. The Midwest farmer inadvertently has become the mallard's best friend, and the mallard grazes on his bounty almost like domestic livestock. But a corn diet, while nourishing, can have serious side effects. At their watering and resting places, ducks search the bottom for tidbits and grit. In shallow marshes, they sometimes pick up lead pellets scattered during the hunting season. The pellets are slowly broken down in the gizzard, and the lead is absorbed into the bird's system resulting in lead poisoning. For some reason, birds on a straight, whole corn diet suffer most. This duck, obviously sick from lead poisoning, will die a victim of the hunting season long past, though no hunter will ever know. As winter retreats northward, the birds follow, seeking ice-free water as they go. Increasing daylight triggers hormone changes. The drakes become belligerent and begin stylized fighting. These bluffing chest-to-chest -chest contests perhaps establish dominance that affects final mate selection. Such bouts seldom last long, however. Group courting displays are another aspect of mate selection. Small parties of drakes suddenly respond to some hidden signal in a synchronized fashion. The hen intensifies her attentiveness to the drake. begin to indulge in courting parties, wide flights of a single hen with several suitors. The bonds of mating are firming up rapidly. But there's still time for what we humans might call play.
business of mate selection is deadly serious now, although actual nesting may be weeks away. The excess of males makes competition severe, and intruding males are ruthlessly driven off. All this behavior and subtle internal changes are preparing both male and female for their ultimate destiny. Somewhere along the path of their great northward journey, the pair reaches the physiological and psychological state that results in mating. and early April, although winter's grip may still be on the land, the mallards begin to arrive on their nesting grounds. This is an area the biologists dub the duck factory. It encompasses the great northern prairies, from Minnesota and the Dakotas, north through southern and central Manitoba, Saskatchewan and Alberta. 10,000 years ago, the last glaciers retreated from this land and in their wake left countless potholes that now hold winter's runoff of ice and snow. Shallow for the most part and varying in size and shape, these are what the mallards seek. They prefer the marsh and pothole country because of its abundant shallow water with rich aquatic plant growth and tiny animal life, all essential to the diet of ducklings. The mated pairs select a secluded portion of the shoreline, or even a muskrat house, for their territory. This home site, defended by the drake, affords the pair privacy from other mallards, and availability of such sites largely governs mallard production. Many small potholes offer better conditions than one big water area. Other waterfowl seek this country too, and hard on the heels of the mallard come other species, adding their voices to the symphony of the marsh. Here are blue-winged teal and bald pate. Here too is the sorrow rail, a fine fall game bird. The avocet that probes the rich mud for food. The solemnly comic pied bill grebe nature's own submarine, and uptown cousins, the horned greaves. Colorful yellow-headed blackbirds, the familiar red wing, and his somber colored mate. And swallows by the thousands, feeding on clouds of insects hovering over the marsh. The lives of all these creatures are interwoven with the water of the pothole country. It's late April in the marsh. The mallard hen has selected the site for her nest. She scratched out a shallow bowl and began to lay her eggs, at first on the bare ground. But as nesting progresses, she'll add bits of vegetation and down from her breast and belly. Nearby, the sentinel drake waits for his mate to finish laying. The hen has laid an egg daily and her clutch of ten is nearly completed. She arranges cover to conceal the eggs when she leaves to feed. She takes wing to the pair's territory, which may be as much as a mile away from the nest. Over the territory, she is spotted by the male, who joins her for a swinging flight across the marsh. These are the last few days of freedom before the long task of incubation begins. Together they feed and loaf. He will keep her company until she starts incubation. After that, he will lose interest and depart. His role as a mate will be finished. These are water birds, and the marsh or pothole is what draws them here, though mallards typically nest on dry land.
In the pothole country, there is no dearth of nesting sites, for mallard hens show a lot of individuality in nest site selection. Some early nests may be exposed, but plant growth may completely conceal the hen and nest as the season progresses. Occasionally, a hen may choose to nest at the water's edge, like this one in a tangle of old rows. Cultivated land doesn't necessarily discourage her choice, as long as there is good nesting cover, nor does the fairly open cover of this particular location. In a typical nest, tall grass shadows break up body contours and blend with plumage. It will conceal her from the searching eyes of enemies. Even branches help break up outline and color patterns. The marsh and potholes are the focus for other birds we collectively call waterfowl, although some of these may not actually nest near the water itself. Each species seeks a slightly different nesting site, like this horned grebe's floating nest. And a single marsh with its surrounding land can support many different kinds of waterfowl. A canvasback hen makes her nest platform in emergent vegetation. A neighbor nearby, the redhead, has taken a huge pile of dead cattails for her nest foundation. She'll incubate her own eggs and possibly those of another redhead's. It's an old trick of the redhead to lay eggs in nests of other ducks. A coot or mud hen has just hatched. And almost immediately, one of the parents takes it from the nest. Sometimes there is interspecies rivalry. This ruddy duck challenges the new arrival. The black tern's nest is just high enough to keep the eggs out of the water. In the nearby meadow, the sorrel rail has its woven nest cup made of stems and leaves. Like mallards, Shovelers loaf and feed in their portion of the pothole before the hen begins brooding her eggs. They like dense grass for a nest site. Placid blue-winged teal swim together when the hen's off the nest, which is usually located back from the water's edge. A pintail may nest as far as two miles from water. But for all these species, water is absolutely necessary and it must have nesting situations the birds will accept. Water in duck factory country comes largely from snow melt or spring rains. In years when snow and rain are scanty, ducks and men both suffer. Man's crop production is affected and the potholes don't fill. One year of drought can seriously affect waterfowl dependent on the north central prairies. Should the years of drought stretch out to three, four, or five, disaster overtakes all water birds. Adaptable ducks, like the mallard, may sometimes move on to other areas, but they meet competition there and find living conditions less desirable. The result is fewer young produced and cutbacks in the bag limits of hunters. Natural droughts come and go. It is the drought caused by man that is permanent and final. These same duck factory lands that produce waterfowl in teeming abundance can often also produce grain. Man, with his drainage projects to benefit agriculture, has created droughts by eliminating the marsh and pothole entirely and forever. Through drainage, Possibly two-thirds of the United States waterfowl production potential has been lost. Sadly, tax money of duck hunters has gone into this drainage through subsidies to agriculture. Even more sadly, the drainage subsidies are paid in the name of conservation. And Canada's marshes and potholes are being threatened too 
by demands of agriculture there. But this female has found water and nesting conditions to her liking. Her body warmth seeps into the eggs, stimulating the life within to grow. In two days' time, the pulsing heart of the embryo is drawing nourishment from the yolk through the forming network of blood vessels. A new mallard is in the making. From her narrowed world of the nest, Every sound and movement will have a sinister meaning. Spring nights are chilly, but the eggs are warm. And after four days of warmth and nourishment, the duckling's body is formed. The hen rotates the egg several times daily to prevent the embryos from sticking to the egg membranes and to ensure even warmth to all eggs. At one week, the new life can move within the membrane. Twice daily, the hen carefully tries to hide the precious eggs and preserve their warmth when she leaves to feed. Not all mallard nests hatch. Possibly one half of the early nests are unsuccessful. The striped skunk preys heavily on prairie nests and takes a toll. So too does the raccoon. Another foe is the crow, which watches the hen leave the nest, then attacks the unprotected eggs. Such predation is part of life and probably not a serious limiting factor. Nor are farming operations that destroy the occasional mallard nesting attempt in fallow fields. But each nest lost takes a bite of each year's production. Even fire takes a share as farmers burned clear land. But early nesting losses to various causes have been provided for by nature and can be offset, at least in part. Should the nest be destroyed, there are unmated males still sexually active that will mate with the hen so that she may re-nest. Since perhaps half the first nests are destroyed, the excess of males in the mallard population has an important role in brood production. The first signs of hatching are the tiny star-shaped crack and the voice of the duckling peeping inside the egg. Incubation averages about 24 days ending with the emergence of the tiny duckling. It must be brooded until dry and fluffy. Then it and its nest mates are ready to leave the nest and begin their hazardous way through life. A hen's instinct tells her that the new brood needs a marsh for water and food. All sorts of predation and accidents can befall the young as they make their way overland to the friendly water. During their first hours of life, they have become imprinted, learning their mother and the signals that will soon mean life or death to them. Mother Mallard selects a marsh that suits her fancy. She usually prefers a bigger water area than the one where she and her drake have their territory. She needs an abundant supply of plant and small animal life upon which the young can feed. The ducklings can swim and dive as soon as their down dries from hatching, but they feed mostly above the water surface at first. The bonds between ducklings and their aquatic environment are forged early. A low warning signal and the ducklings become motionless as a foraging marsh hawk cruises overhead. The hawk fails to detect the motionless young, but the hen leads her brood into protective cover. The heavy cover offers protection from one predator, but another has found it to its liking. 
this American bittern will gobble anything from tadpole to young muskrat. The mallard hen, like mothers everywhere, protects her young and attempts to intimidate the bittern. The tiny brood has given her the courage to challenge the larger bird. Apparently she is successful. The menacing bittern will look elsewhere for his meal. The predatory mink might be a tougher adversary, for he feeds on ducklings too. Should they be unwary, the crow is always on hand to attack and seldom misses a chance for a meal. The chief protection for the young is the water and even denser plant growth in which to hide. Now a bit over a week old, the young look much the same as when they hatched, though their colors have faded somewhat. At two weeks, the young mallard is growing rapidly. The head and tail are more prominent, though the bird is still covered with down. The tiny wings are almost laughable. Other species are using the water holes too. Most young ducks superficially resemble each other, but the bills of these young shovelers or spoonbills easily distinguish them, even at three weeks of age. Water is vital to all ducklings, but summer drought may strike with dramatic suddenness. There may have been water here when nesting began, but these young mallards are mute testimony to weather's fickleness. Ducklings can and do travel great distances to seek water, but if drought is widespread, their chances of survival are slim. At every turn, waterfowl are utterly dependent on an assured supply of water. While the new brood develops, the drakes gather on large open water areas of the marsh, their old hostilities forgotten. There they undergo a spectacular molting of their feathers. The first signs of the change are hen-like feathers that appear on the sides. For two or three weeks, the drakes appear ragged as their bright plumage of the breeding season is gradually replaced by dull brown feathers. All the wing feathers are lost at one time, and the birds are flightless. In this bourgeois brown, called the eclipse plumage, the furtive drakes are camouflaged while unable to fly. This molt occurs first in the drakes that mate earliest. By October, most males will once more wear their usual cavalier colors. Hens undergo a less obvious moat, usually after their broods are on their own. A few hens are still stuck with families when moting overtakes them. Five-week-old ducklings are now mostly feathered, but wing growth has not kept pace. By contrast with the hen, they obviously are not yet fully developed birds. By six weeks of age, some ducklings are almost entirely feathered. A few still lack complete primary wing feathers, but by the time they're about nine weeks old, they will take their first flight. The summer marsh is a pleasant nursery for all sorts of young waterfowl. Its sun-baked mud flats are used by teal. Young, fully feathered gadwalls drift lazily. Mallards and blue wing teal share the same idling spot. By late summer, all these young are ready to take wing. 
but late summer brings troubles in some places and to all species. In shallower marshes, often used by hens and late hatched young, water levels may recede and become stagnant. Here, a bacterium sometimes thrives that causes a disease called botulism, or more commonly, limberneck. The bacteria produce a deadly poison that ducks pick up while feeding or drinking. It paralyzes muscles and kills within 24 hours. Botulism wipes the clammy hand of death across any waterfowl population, indifferently taking the mallard or any bird exposed to its deadly toxin. Around the middle of August, the mallards begin to gather on the bigger bodies of water. Adults with molting and family cares behind them and young flying birds all flock together. These places, called staging areas, are usually close to the smaller potholes and marshes that were the production factories. It is from such areas that migration will begin. But now, they are merely gathering places for the scattered birds and places to continue growth and development. To a mallard's eyes, the staging area waters adjacent to grain fields mean food aplenty. And here is where man and the mallard begin their yearly joust. Duck country is also grain country. The grain elevator is so symbolic of northern prairies, it's featured on Canadian currency. The short growing season in the duck factory makes it necessary for grain farmers to windrow their crops for ripening. They call this operation swathing. Unevenly developed grain will ripen in swaths. It permits an earlier harvest and makes combining easier. It also means the table is set for ducks. You can imagine how a ravenous bunch of mallards might eye such a layout as this, or this. Ducks, like mallards, are quick to grasp an opportunity, and grain swathing, just at the time they flock together on staging areas, does look like a banquet spread just for mallards. Grain fields closest to the staging areas are hit first, and low, wet areas are preferred to higher, drier fields. Ducks feed twice daily, usually about sunset and again at daybreak. Other so-called river or dabbling ducks also feed on swathed grain, although the mallard gets most of the blame. Ducks in any one field may number in the thousands. Since the length of time swaths lie in the field depends on the weather, Ducks can be a real concern to farmers nearby. At first glance, the wind-rowed grain may not appear to be damaged, but looks are deceiving. Closer examination beneath the straw shows the extent of the loss. Besides seeds consumed, there is loss by trampling and knocking grain down so the combine cannot reach it. The damage is really obvious when individual heads are checked against an undamaged one. When whole sections of fields are damaged, farmers suffer a considerable loss and are not too kindly disposed toward ducks. Throughout the short span of the duck factory autumn, it becomes a race between the weather, the harvest, and the ducks. Not all farmers in the area use mechanical harvesters, which makes the contest even more personal. It's no wonder that many of these farmers consider the duck an unnecessary hazard to their livelihood. Solutions to their problems are hard to come by. One effort is the harmless scaring device, like this acetylene-powered gun, designed to frighten ducks from grain. It fires automatically at timed intervals and frees farmers from having to patrol their fields. But 
large fields require many such guns, which may limit their effectiveness. Scare devices merely move birds from one man's field to another's. Other suggested solutions to the problem are to provide crop insurance to farmers, set out established feeding areas using surplus grain, or even renting or buying fields most subject to damage and planting crops there to hold the birds. Whatever the ultimate solution, it will cost money and involve not only duck hunters, but everyone who loves waterfowl wheeling against the sky. And there comes one day, the irresistible urge to fly south. From the many staging areas, the flocks rise into the sky. And in bunches and long skeins begin the journey that may end 2,000 miles away. A few mallards have been wending south as early as September. But the mallard generally is one of the last of the ducks to start. What precisely triggers the grand passage is still unknown but somehow the mallards know that it is time to leave. Adults, who may have made the trip several times, know the familiar landmarks like stream courses and lakes, just like an old river pilot. Birds must stop to rest and feed on the long journey. But tired birds may be unwary, and the deceitful mallards idling at the edge of a sandbar may be a trap. Too late, old birds recall another season. And the young learn a bitter lesson. The next spread of decoys will not look quite so luring. Hunters to the south will find experience has made apt pupils of this flock of mallards. <laughs> Refuges provide sanctuary for birds moving down flyways with fewer marshes and more guns than ever before. Wherever they find lands offering good food and protection, the birds will stop and tarry. Refuges help hold birds, extending local hunting opportunities and providing birds with feeding and resting places they may never have had. Without refuges, many hunters would not see a mallard for they substitute in part for the wetlands man has stolen from the waterfowl. <laughs> Refuges and relatively new large impoundments have changed mallard migration habits. But the mechanical harvester has been the most potent force in this change. Mallards now tarry or even terminate their southward flight when harvesters, rest areas, and water are found together, even though the Corn Belt is far north of their former wintering grounds. Recent advances are making harvest machinery more efficient, reducing grain waste. Eventually, not enough grain may be left to feed wintering birds. And what then? Some mallards stay in the Corn Belt. Many move on to the swamplands of Arkansas and northern Louisiana. There, rice culture has produced huge reservoirs that are used to flood the rice fields. And the abundant water and mild climate hold the bulk of the mid-continent's ducks. These reservoirs substitute for the swamps that were lost to drainage years ago. Pin oaks flourish in the flooded bottom lands and produce nutritious acorns that are a feast for mallards. The coastal marshes of the southern United States are the terminus of the mallard's yearly migration, though fewer winter here than in the past. Here, the mallards meet migrant cousins from the northeast 
like this black duck pair, sometimes called the black mallard. And stay-at-home cousins, mottled ducks. In both these species, the sexes' plumage is colored alike and difficult to distinguish. Here, too, are neighbors of southern climes, like this ibis, which probes Evangeline country mud with sickle-shaped bill. And the undesirable nutria, transplanted from South America, which has made this his year-round residence. Blue and snow geese, old friends from the far north, also winter here. Throughout the long passage south, the mallard and man meet often. From Saskatoon to Sabine, the mallard is the wild fowler's choice. But look. Ever know it to fail? Get caught in the open every time. Well, maybe they didn't see you. At least it's worth a try. You might still pull some out of that bunch. Where's the dog? Better get him in. Come on, boy. Now, start talking to him, Ed. easy to pull one out of that flock. Good dog. Here's another bunch. winged. Watch him. Look at that dog go. Crippled birds can get out of range of the gunner or hide in the vegetation. This is where a good retrieval pays off. Another sunrise another hunter. But in him is man's yearning for the outdoors. In a world of rapidly changing values, these endure. Wild land and water and wild fowl. May they endure forever. They will not unless we make it happen. And we does not mean the hunter alone, but everyone who has thrilled to see ducks weaving enchantment on flashing wings. We have dealt a serious blow to the mallard with our drainage. What followed in the wake of that drainage were crops we didn't need and the loss of ducks we did. The mallard is only one creature of the wild wetlands. Many other birds and animals share the fate of the marshes, swamps, and potholes. What we do to preserve the wetlands for the mallard 
we do also for them. And we must meet the other complicated problems the mallard poses as he sweeps the sky north and south each year. If we can solve these, there is hope for all our continent's wildfowl. Let's hope that wisdom guides us so that the guns of autumn are never stilled for the last time.